the war for the direction of this American culture rages. It rages. The culture has already moved radically away from traditional values of marriage and children and family and education and work and economics and justice and, and, and patriotism, to name just a few areas. The culture has moved strongly away from the traditions. We Christians aren't as interested in traditional values as much as we are interested in biblical values. We want to be clear about that. We're called to follow Jesus and to be like him. And God gives us his word so that that can be the case. But there's no denying that traditional American values were much closer to these biblical values than to whatever it is that we're seeing today. And that atmosphere where it used to be closer to biblical values enabled us Christians to live out Paul's words to Timothy. Look at these words. It's amazing, this scripture. In 1 Timothy, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. When America was closer to biblical values, though it wasn't biblical values per se, but closer to it, we were able to live peaceful and godly lives within this culture. And we very much can to this day, and we praise God for that. And, and that ability to live peaceful and dignified and godly lives is connected to our witness in this world. Do we make that connection? It's a powerful connection between mission or evangelism and our ability to live peacefully. Because God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's good when a society enables Christians to live godly, peaceful, dignified lives. But things have changed so radically that we wonder where it's all heading. It's a real question in front of us. It is clear that if some in power could have their way, some in power, if they could have their way today, they would already have outlawed Christian speech as hate crime. And if they get that opportunity, they will. And in some places, they have. And by the way, this is nothing new. It's an old, rehashed trick of the enemy. It's part of how the government operates as beast in this world. You see that in the book of Revelation. What they do is they blame God's people for the ills of society and then label us as enemies of the state. We are the target of the beast. Now, we all hope for better in our time and in this place. But there's no getting around the fact that these are uncertain times for the church in America. It seems that the government, corporations, the academy, the media, and even retail have little to no concern about rolling over Christian values and putting us in opposition to whatever it is they're espousing. Pride Month is the preeminent illustration for this. And you see all manner of people in the media waxing morally, uh, morally high ground-ish, if I can put it that way, about the importance of celebrating all people. Unless, of course, you're against Pride Month. And they call what is shameful pride. They call it pride to throw off the sovereign rule of God over their lives. And anyone who says otherwise is their enemy. That's the way they're trying to set it up. Whether it succeeds is another question. This war is raging, but it goes far beyond a cultural war in the United States of America. It's actually an ancient war. It's a war that goes back to the very beginning. But I do want to say it's not all bad news, not at all. The answer for us, of course, is not to acquiesce to rebellion, 
But when called upon the Lord in whatever station he has given us, we are to stand as God's people have done for millennia all the way back to the beginning. And so when God calls upon us in our station to stand, let us trust the Lord and let us stand. There's been a great illustration of this that just happened uh, and, and, has, and, and came to fruition this week. And of course it's not over, but it's, it's helpful. It's, it's an illustration for us. Uh, there's a man, I don't know the true state of his faith. He's a Russian Orthodox Christian, but he took a righteous stand to great effect. Ivan Pravor, pra, <laughs> Provornor, pra, no, Provorov. We're just going to call, you know, we're just going to call him Ivan. Thank you for the help, but we're just going to call him Ivan. Ivan is a defenseman for the Philadelphia Flyers. The Flyers were having a pride night back in January. So not only does pride have a month, but there has many other nights of the year as well. And they had a special, and the, and the Philadelphia Flyers had um, special warm-up jerseys. I guess they called them sweaters. We'll, we'll just call them jerseys. That's what we're familiar with. Uh, made for all the players. And, and, and these jerseys looked much like their regular dark outfits. They were black. Uh, they're colored uniforms. But the large numbers on their jerseys w- was all in rainbow colors. And so instead of the white, as, as typical. And so... Um, and they were, they, were, they were supposed to, in the warm-ups, they were supposed to wear these jerseys and then change them out for the game. And this was to, to, to reflect, um, uh, or I should say to genuflect, uh, the Flyers' respect of Pride Night in the warm-ups. Well, Ivan, unlike every other NHL, NHL player to that point, refused to wear the jersey, citing his faith. And immediately the media and special interest groups rained down scorn upon him for not wearing the jersey. They called him a disgrace and disgusting. They said he should go back to Russia where he's from and should have to go to the war against Ukraine. They wanted him to die. They were angry at the Flyers for not punishing them. They looked to, to, to create pressure on the flyers to make this man comply. But Ivan stood his ground. And that's unusual, isn't it? Because sometimes you see people try to take the right stand. As soon as they get blowback, they back off and they apologize. They genuflect. But he stood his ground. And something began to happen. A few other teams started to opt out of pride jerseys. And to make a long story short, the NHL announced three days ago that they have banned specialty warm-up jerseys, period. They banned them. Now, I don't want to make this sound like a moment of national repentance. It is certainly not. The NFL will still celebrate Pride Nights along with other nights. But it's powerful to see how one man standing against a culture that rages against him can make such a difference. The courage, the strength, The grace, that's what we should be like. Now, because of him, he made such a difference that any other Christians in the NHL will not be pressured to put an emblem of support for sodomy on their own body. You see how that could be easily justified, like, well... It's just one night, and I don't agree with it, but they're making me wear it. So, But, he, but, but Christians, are, well, they're able to say now, no, I don't have to put on me a symbol of sodomy. I don't support it. I'm not putting that shirt on. Because of him, they can do that. That's worth something. And it's a great example of, of the conviction of faith being lived out in the war that God's people have always been in since the fall of man. This is not new, but we're being called to it in our time. Now, how does this connect to Genesis chapter 4? Well, the war we find ourselves in began a long time ago, as I said. It's a war that came about because of the fall of man into sin, because of the curse. It's a war between offspring, between brothers, 
It's a war between the children of one mother, but of very different fathers. And here's what I believe God's word is saying to us today. Never fear, children of God, never fear. God's children always prevail. Never fear, children of God, even when, even when the world seems to prevail. They do not. It might be temporary. God's children always prevail. It may look like we are continually losing the war, but again and again, God's children prevail, and we will be victorious in the end. Do you believe that? So if and when the time comes, if the time comes, when the time comes, if God calls you in your station to stand, you stand. You stand. Because God's children always prevail. We're going to watch this war develop over four points in Genesis chapter 4. The first development is spiritual DNA testing. I probably should have called it paternity testing, but you get the idea. Spiritual DNA testing. Let's read chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. And here what we have, it appears to be the first two births. We're not entirely certain. It could be that Daughters were born in this time frame as well. But the reason Cain gets attention is not only because he is probably the very first child of humanity, very first born child. The other, the other two humans were created directly by God. Now God's using means. He's using the reproductive system. But not only that, but because he's a male. Remember the promise God made in the midst of the curse. Genesis 3.15, we'll be coming back to this quite a bit. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you, the offspring, shall bruise his heel. Or rather, the serpent shall bruise his heel. The offspring will bruise the serpent's head and the serpent shall bruise his heel. This is why Eve says, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. But she's about to learn it's not that simple. Some paternity testing is about to happen. And we need to find out who Cain's real father and who Abel's real father is. Now a quick overview note here. It's interesting that chapter 4 is primarily about Cain and his offspring. It's kind of Cain's story. Chapter 4 is kind of Cain's story. And we're meant to learn a pattern from Cain. We're meant to see something that's going to be true about the whole human experience. It's not clear to us who his father is and what kind of life that leads. Well, rather, it's going to become clear who Cain's father is and what kind of life that leads to. So keep that in mind as we progress. Now, isn't it amazing that Cain and Abel even know to make offerings to the Lord? That means they had enough revelation from God himself to know how they ought to worship him. And there should be offerings that are sacrificial and demonstrate gratitude and praise to the Lord. This is amazing grace that God has revealed this to them. So so it's grace upon grace. They've been kicked out of the garden, but here's grace. God says, I want you to keep relating to me. So they bring their offerings, and Abel's is readily accepted, but Cain's offering is rejected by God. Why is it rejected by God? Some have contended that Abel's offering was accepted because it was a blood offering, but the text doesn't really indicate that. And later, when offerings are codified, 
offerings from produce are required as well. So it doesn't seem like the problem is that, is that Cain's offerings were from the field. But we have a key in the text to understand the problem with Cain's offering. Back to Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 up on the screen. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel also brought, uh, brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Now, if these gifts were of the same caliber, you might expect it to read something like this. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and Abel brought of the sheep of his flock. Or Abel brought of the goats of his flock. Something very similar to what was said about Cain. But it doesn't do that. Abel, we're told, we're given some specific points here. Abel, we're told, Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock. The firstborn. So before he paid himself, he brought sacrifice to God. And he brought of their fat portions, or the best part to eat, the, the juiciest, most flavorful portions. In other words, Abel brought his best. Cain, on the other hand, seemed to bring a haphazard portion of his work, not the best, in other words, or worse, And we're not told this directly, but it's possible that Cain brought the stuff that he didn't want anyway. He brought the worst, or he brought the stuff that was rotting. That's possible. And he gives that to God. So Abel brings his best. Cain brings maybe something haphazard or maybe something less than his best. The problem's in the heart. Abel's saying, I'm going to bring my best to God. Cain's saying, I'm going to give God whatever my leftovers may be. You see the difference? The scripture tells us Cain's response, and it's a response we can all relate to. Cain was very angry, and his face fell. He interpreted this as a problem. This situation where his offering was not accepted, he interpreted it as a problem with other people. Or others, namely the Lord, and decided that he was being treated unfairly. He didn't like what had been said to him, and he thought something must be wrong with God or something must be wrong with Abel. And his face showed what was going on inside him. It was going on inside him, and it just came right out on his countenance. He's downcast, he's self pitiful. Well, what does God do in response to Cain's bad attitude? We've seen this many times in our own hearts or with children. Right? They're told that they're wrong about something, and their response is to become self pitiful and angry. Who are they angry at? The parents who told them that they were wrong. Why are they wrong? At th- why are they angry with the parents if they did what's wrong? We see it with kids, but we all do it ourselves, don't we? The cycle. I was wrong. I didn't like that I was told that I was wrong. I didn't like I was called out that I was wrong. And now I'm mad that I was told that I was wrong. And I'm not mad at myself. I'm mad at someone else. What does God do? He responds with even more grace, bearing with the man and his sin upon sin. God corrects him. If you do well, will you not be accepted? It's right here in front of you. Start getting your heart in line and Bring to me the offering that I'm worthy of, that you ought to recognize, being my creature and all that. And God instructs and warns them, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. You see how important it is when we're in that moment, when when we've done wrong and we're angry at others. You see how dangerous that is? When, when that's the case in our hearts, God knows it. We're not fooling him. When that's the case in our hearts, sin is crouching at whose door? Our door. Our door. Can we see how critical it is to have a true interpretation of life? How important the word of God is? Cain interpreted the offering episode as a slight against himself. Who knows what, what excuses he was making? Who knows if he was saying, I always knew I should have been a shepherd, but mom and dad made me a a, a farmer. I never wanted to be a farmer. I shouldn't be a farmer. Why am I a farmer? It's their fault. The 
truth is that Cain was experiencing God's corrective discipline, and Cain had an opportunity to respond to that correction. You and I can do the same in our struggle with sin. We can interpret that God is against us and fail to see the monster crouching at the door. It's the idea of a lion. But think of it this way. Sin is it, it, it's not even put together as well as a lion. Sin is a monster ready to pounce. And, and Cain needs to recognize that monster. And he needs to rule over that monster. He's, he needs to come at that monster with fists flying, you see? This is the right time to be violent against that monster. That monster comes from inside us. That monster is our sin, and we must be ruthless with it. Cain's going down the wrong path. He's been exhorted by God. He's been warned by the Lord. What is he going to do? Well, regardless of whatever he does, never fear, because God's children always prevail. Now the first development in the offspring war is beginning to recognize that there are two fathers, two different family lines. You have Abel's offering, you have Cain's offering and Cain's response. But the second development in this war is the ascension of the serpent's seed. The ascension of the serpent's seed. So go to the text, verses 8 to 16. Let's take, let, let's take a look at that. Let me read it to you. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. That's pretty brief, isn't it, for a murder? Verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And here we see exactly how Cain will respond to his own sin. We see where envy leads. We also see whose son he is. And we see what humanity is capable of. Humanity, as the offspring of the serpent, is capable of what the serpent is capable of. Destroying God's creation, destroying God's top creation, destroying humanity, killing the image of God. Do you see what Cain is really trying to do here? Cain, in murdering Abel because of his own sin, by killing Abel, who is the image of God, and is more like God than himself, while Cain is more like the serpent. Cain wants to destroy God. Cain is trying to kill God. And that's happening in the culture right and left. Right and left, people are, they're coming after the image of God. That's what's behind gender confusion. That's why people are, are, are struggling to understand what's a man, what's a woman. When God's made it abundantly clear, everyone knows down deep what a man is and what a woman is. That's what's beneath that. that. That's why people, and I'm not picking on anyone here. I don't know if anyone has this going on. But that's why people take on unnatural disfigurements to their body. That's why they change their appearance to where it's, it's no longer natural. It's coming from inside them. But it's a distortion of the image of God. Why? Because in rebellion against God, the seed of the serpent wants to kill the image of God. There's nothing new about that. And that's what Cain's doing. You know what else? This is going on in our own hearts. This is what sin is in our own hearts. It's why sin is so deadly. It's why Jesus had to die for it. 
It's why we always need to repent of sin. Because it's that deadly and it's that evil. Cain's seething rage was directed to the human who represented, represented God best to him, and so he killed him. There were no guns or bullets. There probably wasn't even a bow or arrow. No, Cain killed him directly, personally, up close. He may have killed him with his own hands, his bare hands. He may have had a weapon, a knife, or a stone. He may have snuck up behind him and struck him or stabbed him. Or we're not quite sure exactly how he did it, but it was directly with his brother, right in his presence. He wasn't far away. He was right next to him. And he killed his brother because his brother's sacrifice was acceptable to God. That's what's in the heart of humanity. I get to go back to 315 again and make something clear. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. heel. It, God is describing the two offspring that are going to come from the woman. There is the offspring of the serpent and there is the offspring of the woman. That's what you see described there. The serpent's offspring will do what the serpent does. And now we see very clearly the paternity test has been returned. We now see the DNA. Cain is the offspring of the serpent. It takes father and mother to make children. So how exactly is the serpent the father of Cain? Is not Adam the father of Cain? Yes and no. He certainly is biologically. And there's that sense in which Cain is demonstrating the image of God, even as broken as it is. But you remember the story, right? The serpent comes to Eve. And what does the serpent do? He plants in her mind and in her heart an idea. He plants the seed of an idea in her heart and her mind. He plants that doubt. He plants into her, God is not good. God is not good to you. God is hiding good from you. God doesn't want you to know that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will make you a God too. God's hiding that from you. He doesn't want you to know. That's why he said you can't eat of it. The serpent plants the seed. Trust me and you will be like God. When Eve and Adam followed the serpent into rebellion, they empowered the serpent to reproduce through them. The serpent planted his seed, and Cain is his son. That's why Jesus so confidently says to the religious rulers thousands of years later, he says to them, you are of your father, the devil. He's being quite literal, quite direct. He knows exactly what he's saying to them. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. And Jesus is saying to them, you, you're acting uh, like, like this is all appropriate and you're completely reasonable. But I know it's in your heart. You want to kill me just like your serpent father worked in Cain and killed Abel. The horrific truth is, until we are born again, we are all in the serpent's family. You hear me, brothers and sisters? Until we're born again in Christ Jesus, we're all in the serpent's family. But we don't have to remain there. We can be. Many of us have been born again in Christ Jesus. And when we're born again in Christ Jesus, part of the glory of being born again, of being in Christ, as we are adopted into the family of God, we become, in Christ Jesus, we become sons of God. And no longer the seed of the serpent, but instead the seed of the woman. Many of us have already become part of God's family. Have you? Do you belong to the family of God? I have bad news. If you don't belong to his family, it doesn't matter what you ascribe to yourself. God's giving you a choice here. He's saying there's only one of two families to be from. And unless you repudiate your inheritance in the devil, in the serpent, and trust the Son of God, 
then you belong to that family. But if you trust Jesus, you become a brother to Abel, and more importantly, far more importantly, a brother of Jesus the Christ. And you become adopted by God. You become part of God's family. And you will receive the inheritance of God's family. The way we are born again, the way we are regenerated, what, what enables that is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And we have here one of the great, powerful images that we see in Scripture and we sang about earlier. When Abel was killed, Cain, who was a caretaker of the ground, he was a farmer, what does he do? He waters the ground with the blood of Abel. And the ground, God's creation, which has already fallen beneath the curse, is disgusted by this. It's personified in the way God talks about it. The ground cries out against, against Cain. The ground says, we shouldn't be watered with the blood of humans. And the ground is, you, you almost get the sense that the ground is cursing Cain and saying, I will not produce for you now that you have done this. And that blood of Abel that was soaked into the ground, that's the life that God put into Abel. And it cries out to God says, God, look at me. Don't, don't turn a blind eye. Don't miss me. I've been betrayed. I've been deceived. My own brother deceived me and brought me out into a lonely place. He told me to look in one direction and then struck me dead. He struck me to the ground. I've been betrayed. I was murdered. My life taken away, the gift you gave me, taken away from me. God, don't miss this, please. Don't overlook this, please. You have to avenge me. That's what Abel's blood is crying from the ground. And that's what the, that's what the guilt and the blood of all, shed, of all the shed blood of mankind cries out from the ground. The problem is all of mankind is guilty for this shed blood. And we see that in Jesus. When he goes to the cross and his blood runs down the cross, runs into the ground and waters the earth again. And that blood should be crying the same thing as Abel, except not just against one man, but against all mankind. God, I, I am your son, Father. I, I am through whom and for whom all of this has been created, including these very lowly lives that have cursed me and condemned me and killed me. His blood should be saying, wipe them out. Give me justice, Father. But Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24 tells us that the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. You know what that word speaks. Even though all of our guilt is tied up in the execution of the only perfect man, the God-man Jesus Christ, that blood shed to the ground, watering the ground, it rises up and says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Give life to everyone who trusts in my name. This blood is for them. Count this shed blood. Count it as the payment for their sin so that they will never be held accountable and instead are credited with my life and my righteousness. That is the better word of the blood of Christ on our behalf. Dear friend, if you have not yet trusted Jesus, Trust him now. His blood cries out to you. And, will, and, and if you trust him, it will cry out for you, Father, forgive her. Forgive him forever. Cain is punished to be certain. And his punishment is devastating. But God does not kill him. More grace to Cain. Instead, God protects him. 
Don't worry, the Lord is not confused as to, as to the murderous intent of Cain. God has his good purposes even in this and what he's doing. Well, we come to this point and we see that Cain goes on living. And to, the, and, and to those that don't understand, as we look at this, we, it can seem to us that the seed of the serpent is the one who's victorious. But never fear. God's children always prevail. So even now, don't fear. We've seen the serpent's seed ascend now. It ascends, but the bad news is not over. Now we're going to see the corrupt prosperity of the serpent's seed. Because so often it looks like it's the serpent seed that's winning in this world. And so, look at verses 17 to 24. 17 to 24. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Erad, and Erad father Mahuyel, and Mahuyel fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other Zillah. Ada bore Jabal, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his two wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I've killed a young man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Now God said that Cain would be a fugitive and a wanderer, and he certainly was a fugitive from Adam's family. But Cain decided that he would no longer wander. You know what he does? He builds a city. He settles down. It may not have been much of a city, but nevertheless, it was a settled place. And he said, no, God, I will no longer wander. I will settle down. And in case you're wondering where his wife came from, don't forget that they're, all the people at this point, they're living for many centuries. And so um, um, that means Adam and Eve would have had many more children, and their children would have had children, and so on. So within, within one century, there could have easily been thousands of humans, thousands. And so Cain settled, he builds a city, and it seems that life is good for his clan. Children are born to his clan, and they begin to gain accomplishments as fathers and founders. But even as his family prospers, sin increases. God is not worshipped. But the Canaanites, instead of talking about calling on the name of the Lord, the Canaanites tend trend away from God's ways into rebellion. We see that in Cain's great, great, great grandson, Lamech. Lamech takes two wives, and that's not how it's supposed to be. God gave to Adam one woman. God looked at Adam, and he said it's not good for man to be alone. And so he makes a helper for Adam, and he gives him one woman. And Adam is to be a one-woman man. God doesn't give him multiple women God gives him one woman, one husband, and one wife is the creation blueprint, and much trouble will come to humanity, much pain, much sorrow, much anguish because of both polygamy and divorce. Those of you that have experienced divorce have experienced pain, and I'm sorry for that. That comes in part because the world rejected God's blueprint. God's gracious and glorious way. Guess what? Lamech prospers. He's got two wives. He's breaking the blueprint. He's making his own blueprint, but he seems to prosper. His one son, Jabal, was the father, founder of Bedouins. and I mean those who dwell in tents and, and have livestock. They travel around with their livestock. And it was his son who pioneered. It was, it was Lamech's son, this rebellious, arrogant man, who pioneered that life. Another one of Lamech's sons, Jubal, was the father or the founder of all those who played the lyre and pipe. I think the lyre is a stringed instrument. And so if you happen to see a guitar player up here, you have to wonder who their father is. No. Our, our guitar players have been born again in Jesus Christ, right? They belong to God. But it was his son who pioneered 
who founded. He must have been incredibly musical to do string and wind instruments. That came from Lamech's line. And even another son became the father or the founder of industry. Those who forge instruments of bronze and iron, they're, they're tool makers, they're, they're machinists, they're probably tools and weapons they're making. And if you're wondering why Lamech's daughter is listed here, she just listed, is probably to show Lamech's prosperity. She's probably like a princess. And so this is his sort of first family. But even as culture, technology, industry, the arts increase, even as they increase on the earth, through Cain's line, through the Cainites, so does sin increase. Because then we get this little ditty. It's a song from Lamech, and it's quite revealing. I'm not going to read it again, but in the song he calls his wives together. He says, hey, he starts boasting to them, I killed a young man for wounding me. That young man, by the way, given the grammar, is probably quite young. Lamech was probably much bigger, much stronger, and more experienced. And the young man did something hurtful to Lamech, so Lamech responds disproportionately by destroying him, doing what his father had done. And he feels entirely justified. He even boasts about it. He sings, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. In other words, if anyone messes with Cain, I know God's going to avenge him seven times. So surely, for a great man like myself, who has two wives and not just one wife, and has all these children who are doing all these great things, then I will be avenged an infinite time more than Cain. Let's say 70 times seven. Lamech believes he should be able to distribute whatever retribution he likes, that he's godlike, and he gives eternal and ultimate judgment, which of course is not true. That is titanic arrogance in direct rebellion to God. But as in all matters, Jesus sets it straight. Jesus takes it and sets it straight. Matthew 18, when Peter came up and said to him, Lord... How often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. You see, instead of infinite vengeance, just like his blood that cries from the ground, a better word for us, for those that trust him. Jesus says, do you, do you see what we have? And he says, he says, instead of ultimate vengeance on those that trust in me, and, and, and your brothers and sisters with one another, instead of ultimate vengeance on one another, instead of retribution on one another, Jesus says, look to me and give to one another as you have received, which is overwhelming, abundant, eternal grace. You see how human culture and human sin, they're increasing together. You may have heard the idea of redeeming the culture. I think there are some good impulses in that idea and there's some truth in that idea, but we still need to, comp we, when we engage that idea, we need to understand more clearly what's being said. Because here's what we're being shown in Genesis 4. We're being shown that humans can accomplish great things, but they're always going to do so in conjunction with an increase in sin. And we're going to see this even more in the next point. The point is this. Don't be so quick to celebrate culture and to take it for your own. Don't be so quick to throw yourself into the delights of culture. Because culture's very origin, the development of all these technologies and all these great things and all the arts and all, the, all of that, always had sin intertwined with it and always had sin increasing with it from the very beginning which is why every single form of government will always let us down. And every institution will never be perfected. I mean, just take it out and, and go on and on with it, which is why the arts will never be completely used for the glory of God, not until Jesus returns. Instead of being so quick to celebrate culture and to align with it and to delight in it, instead be skeptical of culture. Be clear about what's glorifying to God and what's not. And be cautious. It seems like the serpent's seed is winning, doesn't it? I mean, Cain's, 
kids are just prospering and Lamech's killing people and he's celebrating it and he's doing great. It seems like the serpent seed is winning, but never fear. God's children prevail. God's children always prevail. God's children will always prevail. And that brings us to the fourth development in this war between brothers. The unstoppable offspring of God. This story has been about Cain, the seed of the serpent and his family. But it doesn't end there. This And the end of this portion of Scripture has a critical turn in emphasis. Look at the last two verses of chapter 4, 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel. For Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Before verse 25, you have to begin to ask, does the promise just end here? That promise from, from uh, chapter 3, verse 15, where the, where the offspring of the woman will crush the serpent's head, does it just end here? Abel, the apparent seed of the woman, uh, as opposed to the serpent, has been murdered? The very first human male is clearly the seed of the serpent? Wow, where does that leave humanity? But here we see Eve bears a son. She calls his name Seth. Seth means granted. God has granted or appointed a son in place of Abel. And there's our first hint that Seth is not the seed of the serpent. Cain was. Abel was not. Nor is Seth. And so we see the promise will not fail, but it remains. The son of the woman will crush the serpent's head. But we see even more in these two little verses. The scripture says that at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. To call upon the name of the Lord certainly means that people cried out to God. But it means more than that. It also means that people were proclaiming the name of the Lord. And what does it mean to proclaim the name of the Lord? It means to tell others about the Lord. It means to call people to trust in the Lord. It means to call people to worship the Lord. It means to teach people who God is, who the Lord is, and what the Lord does. In other words, what's happening right now? What's happening right now is people calling upon the name of the Lord. You see this? Don't take this for granted. You see what we're doing here? Gathered, worshiping God, sitting under his word. Don't ever take it for granted. Don't sell it short. It's not a guarantee. There are times in in history where people are not calling on the name of the Lord. But here we are, calling on his name together to his glory. This is God's people, God's children prevailing over the seed of the serpent. This is, what we're doing is God's people crushing the serpent's head. In defiance of the serpent, we say, oh no, oh no, no. We call on the name of the Lord. We will worship him. We will proclaim him. That's what we're doing. You see, Cain's line was building cities and technology and industry and the arts They were building culture. But what are God's children building? What are God's children building? We're building worship to the one true God who deserves the full and complete worship. All of humanity ought to come with a rightful offering to the Lord. And we know now that rightful offering is Jesus, the Son of God. So we should come in his name and lift him up. This is why Christians fundamentally are not cool in the eyes of the world. This is why it's futile to try to be so. This is why it's foolish to make that a part of our endeavor. Forget it. You can't be. Oh, you might be for a time. You might get away with it. But at some point, you're going to have to either compromise. Because the culture of the world is the seed of the serpent. And they're building what they build. And we build what God calls us to build. We can't go with them in all their endeavors. We just can't. We are and should be occupied with proclaiming the name of the Lord to the world. 
that may cause us to seem more simple in their eyes or foolish in their eyes. So be it. It has always been and it will always be until the Lord returns. Is it not fascinating that the story ends here? All of this dynamism and drama from Cain and his line. It seems like the war between the offspring is all one-sided, but then there's this at the end. It's like God is saying, no, the promise is not ended with Cain's wickedness. The, the, the promise is not ended with the seed of the serpent. My promise continues and will come to fruition. And my people will look to me and call upon me and nothing will ever stop that. They will stand up in my name and even if they are slain by the seed of the serpent, they will prevail because that's who we are. I'd like to ask Doug to come, and we're going to sing just briefly here in closing. Never fear, dear friends. God's children always prevail. We always prevail in the end because we're in God's hands. Now, I put this proposition that you, you see up here on the screen. If I can get that last uh, slide, that proposition. Never fear, God's children always prevail. I put that in terms of God's children rather than God. You know, you could say, never fear, God always prevails, right? That would be perfectly right. But I put it in those terms because, because Genesis 3.15 talks about the, the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman, crushing the serpent's head. So it's God's child prevailing against the devil. So I put it in those terms. And we know that the reason God's children prevail is because of God. But Genesis 3 says that the offspring of the women is going to crush the serpent's head. Now, this begs the question as to who is the father of the, of the woman's offspring? So you've got, because it takes father and mother to make offspring, right? So you've got the, you have the woman and the serpent, the serpent being the father of the serpent's offspring. But then the verse 15 just says, uh, your offspring, like it's just the woman's offspring. But of course it's not. Adam, of course, is the, is the biological father, passing along the image of God to all humans. Also, as the representative head, passing along sin from generation to generation. To both Cain and to Seth. But there's something greater going on here, right? Like we talked about the serpent planting the seed in the heart and mind of Eve... And therefore, he's the true father of Cain. Well, who's the true father of Seth? So that he could be the offspring that crushes the serpent's head. Because you need a dad. We finally get it clear that God will be the father. Because in the fullness of time, God sends forth his son, born of a virgin, and that son is both man and God. And that offspring is Jesus. The full and final fulfillment of God's promise is Genesis 3.15. And as God's son, he prevails once and for all over the serpent and his seed. And he guarantees that, us for, uh, for us, that, he guarantees that for us as well. Would you please stand with us, please? Never fear, God's children will always prevail because of our big brother, our Savior, our King, our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing his praise.